I think the clock has dropped around six o'clock, so um, I think we can call the meeting to order. We're all comfortable, we're all in place. Yes, I think we are. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the 158th meeting of, yes, 158th meeting of the members of the Hinckley and Rugby Building Society. <coughs> My name is Colin Franklin and I am chair of the society. And I'm joined here this evening uh, by my board colleagues who are scattered amongst the audience there. Uh, and I know we've been talking to you um, before the meeting. Uh, members of the senior management team here. Uh, and we also welcome Lee Whitaker from Housens, our independent scrutineers, who uh, will ensure that the voting uh, is take, takes place in a proper manner this evening. Uh, I'm also pleased to welcome representatives uh, from charitable organisations who are here for a very good reason and we'll come to that later on. Firstly, I've got a couple of housekeeping notices. Firstly, the, the meeting is being recorded. Um, a copy of the recording, which I'm sure will be a bestseller, will be posted onto the Society's uh, website in the days following the AGM. Uh, and the other notice is that we do not have a scheduled fire drill this evening, so if the alarm does sound, you should make your way out to the nearest exit, which is those doors at the front there, and make your way up Upper Bond Street to the alley just by the Queen's Head pub, where th there's a meeting point. Can I ask you not to go in the pub? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I won't see you again, probably. So, um, This is the uh, agenda for this evening. Uh, following a, some welcome remarks from myself, I will ask our Chief Executive, Barry Carter, to conduct a, a review of 2023 and look forward to 2024, um, following which we'll be moving into the, the business part of the meeting, which is uh, uh, looking at the resolutions that we have before us and voting on those. And uh, following that, of course, we'll be looking at the results, but before that, we will also have a presentation from uh, charitable, two charitable organisations who will talk about the work that they do. Uh, and and uh, I think you will agree uh, that both organisations that we're very proud to support. Uh, there will be plenty of uh, opportunity for questions and answers, both before we go into the, the voting and also at the end to, to uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. And then finally, we'll, we'll draw the meeting to a conclusion, which is when you can go in the pub, the Queen's Head just up the road. Uh, Barry uh, Carter will be uh, sharing his review of the year, as I've just said, so I'll keep my opening remarks brief. Uh, over the, the last 12 months, we've seen a, a year of increasing interest rates. Uh, 2023 had the highest Bank of England base rate increase for 15 years, increasing from 3% to 5.25%. Now, we've worked hard to ensure that we continue to support both our borrowers, who are being impacted with higher monthly repayments, of course, and savers, who, who quite rightly are seeking good returns on their savings, particularly in times of high inflation. And the balance between being fair to borrowers whilst enhancing the saving rates whenever we can has remained our key objective. I'm pleased to report that your society had a strong financial year, even against the challenging economic environment. Profits increased and exceeded our original budget, in fact. So we were able to continue to strengthen our staff base and continue our investment in services for our members. <coughs> During the year, we launched a new website, which increased functionality for our members and helped us to communicate more clearly. We also launched a workplace savings scheme, something I have to say I'm very keen on uh, myself, uh, encouraging employers and employees to get into the habit of making regular savings. In difficult times, putting a little aside each month is very important. Our biggest investment for the future continues to be our digital programme. 
in September of last year, we moved our core operating system into a fully managed service in the cloud. And this change was delivered on time and within budget and helped to provide your board with confidence in the society's ability to manage this level of change. And this positions your society well to implement new online mortgage and savings enhancements in 2024 and to introduce a mobile app for the first time. This year's financial performance also helped to maintain your society's capital base, which supports sustainable ongoing growth in the years ahead. The introduction of the consumer duty by the FCA has further emphasised the need to put the needs of our members first. And your board saw this as an opportunity to reiterate the customer focus of your society to ensure that good outcomes for our members are always sought. And we felt that the introduction of the duty presented a good opportunity for us to revisit the society's purpose, our ambitions and our values during the year. To ensure that they are embedded in everything that the society does and underpin our goals, each member of staff's annual objectives include measures linked to these values. Support for our local communities continue to be a key priority and through our charitable foundation in 2023, we've donated a total of nearly £22,000 to six local charities. In addition, we donated £10,000 to the Friends of St Cross Hospital, Rugby. And we're delighted that some of the charities that we will be supporting are here this evening. The Society are long-term supporters of Leicestershire Cares, a local charity that supports children and young people to reach their full potential. For every vote cast at this AGM, we will make a donation to Leicestershire Cares. We take great pride in the work that we do to support our communities, and we will continue to share our knowledge, our skills and our resources throughout Leicestershire and Warwickshire. Now, as a board, we've been developing our succession plan and ensuring that we offer continuous, dedicated support to the society. This has also helped us prepare for the planned retirement of four non-executive directors over the past 12 months. The succession plan has ensured that we have the right skills and experience for the future. We've had several changes to our board over the last 12 months. David Woodward and Janine Bell retired at our last AGM. We were all very saddened to learn of the recent sudden death of Janine. Janine played an important role as a non-executive director of the society for nine years. She was very popular with all at the society and she will be sadly missed. We send our sincerest condolences to Janine's family and friends. Following the conclusion of this AGM, Gary Wilkinson will also stand down as non-executive. Where are you, Gary? Hello. Uh, <clears throat> Gary has brought his invaluable experience to the board, and particularly his ex excellent stewardship of the risk committee during his term. So thank you, Gary, for your, your, your sterling service. We welcome two independent non-executive directors to, to the board, Tony Alexander, here he is, uh, who was appointed to the board on the 1st of December. Uh, Tony will take over as our chair of the risk committee. And Manuela Pifani, where are you? There, we go, there she is, who stands for election to be appointed to your board today. Manuela brings a very impressive customer focused pedigree. Within the year, we also welcomed John Lowe. Where is it? There he is. <laughs> who um, 
uh, who replaced David Woodward as chair of the Audit and Compliance Committee, and Linda Blackwell, who joined as a non-executive director and has taken on the role of our consumer duty champion. Hello, Linda. Welcome to all, all of our, our new directors. Colin Fife also stepped down from his role on the 2nd of January 2024, having served as Chief Executive since 2018. Colin has guided the Society through a challenging but successful five years. He's played a very important role at a key period of the Society's development, as well as through the challenges of the COVID pandemic. I wish Colin, I'm sure we all wish Colin well, for the next stage of his career. I was delighted that we were able to find a worthy successor from within the Society. Barry Carter uh, joined the Society in July 2022 and has worked closely with Colin from day one. In the autumn of 2023, we undertook a full market search for Colin's replacement, and I'm pleased to say that our internal candidate had the skills that we were looking for to take the Society to the next level. And I wish Barry every success following his appointment as Chief Executive Officer. Which brings me to my own departure. After almost nine years on the Hinkley and Rugby Board, I am retiring at the end of this meeting as non-executive and chair of the board. I'm delighted to announce that Nemony Wynne Evans, take a bow Nemony, uh, who has been a non-executive at Hinkley and Rugby for the past seven years, was nominated by the board to take over as chair. And we've been very fortunate to have uh, this excellent talent on our board and the society will be in very good hands. Before I hand over to Barry, I would just like to say that as a lifelong advocate of building societies, that's mutual organisations run by the members for the members, I am proud to have been chair of the Hinkley and Rugby, an organisation which remains true to the mutual concept, never losing sight that the board is here to ensure that the society is run in the best interest of members, not outside, outside shareholders or anyone else, it's for the interest of members. And I know that these principles will remain as a focus for the board in the future. So finally, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to all staff and fellow directors, not only for their <coughs> personal support, but also for their hard work and commitment on behalf of the Society's members. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And Barry will now conduct his review of the year. Well, firstly, thank you, Colin. Uh, it's quite an AGM. Uh, not only is it my first as a CEO, but as you have pointed out, the last uh, is yourself as the chair. And on behalf of everybody in the society, both colleagues, members, thank you for your role that you played. It's been great to have you here. And I'm sure you will be sorely missed, but look upon us far fondly. This evening I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our performance in 2023, drawing out some of the achievements in areas where we've succeeded and in some of the areas where I think we want to be a little bit more focused on as we look into 2024 and beyond. But before I do that, if I could just extend to so just a couple of minutes, as, uh, as Colin has already alluded to, and introduce myself. As the slide says, Barry Carter, I've been here since 2022 and joined society as the Chief Operating Officer. And in that role, it allowed me to focus on the changes that we were looking to make in the society to bring to life our digital agenda and really make sure that we were positioning ourselves well for the next chapter. So for me, it's been a fantastic opportunity to really get to grips and understand what makes this such a great organisation and then look forward to leading it over the next few years. If you cast your mind back to the sort of summer and later part of 2022, when I joined, it was during the sort of the Liz Trust Mini budget challenge. And that will become relevant in a second as we go through some of the slides. But it was a period that really sparked rapid rate increases and saw both the housing and the savings market turn upon its head. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that's relevant in a few slides. But I've really enjoyed that period and seen as an opportunity as to where we can really concentrate and make sure that 
that we are focusing on the areas that really sets us apart, in particular being a niche lender. So, if I can move to the next slide. I've got Luke, who's much more capable of uh, steering the slides for me here, so forgive me if I just uh, look over every now and then. Over the past few years, you would have heard Colin Fife, the previous uh, CEO, talk about our balanced scorecard. And what I wanted to do was to provide a little bit of continuity and just to talk to you about why that matters and how we've been assessing our year uh, and how we will use it going forward. But the purpose of the balanced scorecard is to really set our objectives as a business. We group them into these key focus areas, but also being quite clear about what good looks like and what we want to achieve from them. What I've not shown you is the very many number of metrics that sit behind that, but instead just the high level things that we're looking to try and achieve. So the members, uh, the balanced scorecard consisting of the financial excellence, people, member and community, all headings of how we think about and how we set ourselves up for the year. So look onto the next one. So a busy slide, financial. I'm sure you will have had a look at our year-end accounts, our report. Uh, but I just wanted to draw out six slides from this. And don't worry, I'm not asking you, particularly those at the back, to see the numbers. But I'll just talk to them a little bit about why they're important and what they mean for us. So I think these six charts really give a, a good overview of how the, the year has been, in particular viewed the, sort of the journey that we've been over the past few years. As you know, as a society, we don't focus, and as a mutual, we don't focus on profit maximization, but instead profit optimization. And what I mean by that is not just simply a play in the words. It's about not having shareholders and doing the right thing, as Colin talked about, of running the society for the society. It's about achieving sustainable financial positions, which, al which allows us to uh, return the rewards to our members and invest in the longevity of the society. So if I look to the top left graph, you will see that the society achieved a profit of 1.62 million, which obviously is an increase over 2022, and perhaps the, the highest profit that we've seen for quite a number of years. As I move to the right of that, the net interest margin, the society focuses quite heavily on net interest margin. And very broadly, that is the difference between the interest rates that we pay on savings and the, what we charge on mortgages and the balance that Colin mentioned earlier about finding that uh, fair position to be in is quite an important one for us to make sure we pass on benefits to the savings members and are fair to those that are the borrowing members. And the graph shows that it has been steadily increasing over the past few years, rising to 1.65 in 2023. And this will remain an important metric for us over the next five years. And we will continue to see an increase in the spread in the net interest margin as we find the balance between savings and borrowing. You might have heard that in 2023, the industry was under quite a bit of challenge from both regulators, government, to make sure that uh, financial services firms were passing on the rates to, borrow, uh, to their savers, but also to charge fairly on their uh, borrowers. And I'm very pleased to say that the society has worked very hard to pass on the benefits to our members where we have uh, over this year. And in fact, many uh, in fact, over the course of 2023, we actually found ourselves towards the top of both savings and mortgage charts for best products, which I think is quite telling in that difficult market. Moving further to the right, the costs have increased over in 2023. Uh, and as you know, that is a position where we have started to see the cost being incurred for some of our digital investment. Now, it's obviously an area where it needs to be controlled and you don't want to have uncontrolled cost rises for obvious reasons. So looking into 2024 and beyond, this will be an area where I'll lead my team into a more cost-effective way of operating and seeking for opportunities to strip out uh, inefficiencies and find a more efficient way of operating and balance our overall cost profile. <laughs> Moving down to the next set of graphs. Now, the society, as you'll see at the bottom on the left, and again, I appreciate, sorry, this might be a little bit difficult, but I'm making the assumption that you've had a look at our year-end report. So, the society is largely funded from retail deposits. And what this graph is telling us that, simply put, our, save, the, our savers uh, deposit their monies with us, which we then lend back out to our mortgage members. And we've also had the ability as an organization, as many other banks, building societies, and other financial services providers have been able to lend or borrow against the Bank of England wholesale market, termed TFSME. 
It's a very cost effective way of borrowing and that many have been involved, that many have utilised over the past few years. And in fact, the scheme has been in existence for quite some time and was extended during the COVID period. But what you are seeing in the market is over 2023 and into 2024, that it's unlikely that Bank of England will continue this scheme and will look for these monies to be repaid. And as such, we've taken a very prudent approach to be repaying that debt at £2 million per month. Quite an important one for to raise the point, because what you will be seeing out in the market at this point in time is some quite different interest rates that people are willing to pay as they look to refinance that. But the prudent approach that we're taking to repay that debt over £2, uh, £2 million per month will see us to be more of a retail-funded business, but a very prudent approach to be. The next two graphs, if I just move forward, one is showing a total asset uh, position. You will see that the green columns, again, are growing, which represents the growth of our mortgage book. Uh, this remains, obviously, a very, very key area for us, and we intend and will always be looking to grow our mortgage book at a, a sustainable and steady rate matched by the growth of our savings book. There's not an easy task to do in this market for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. We're still seeing the lingering effects of that 2022 budget, <laughs> increased interest rates and inflation and other headwinds in the mortgage market. But it remains the, the reason that why we're here and we will continue to support our members and communities and help them support a better, better financial future for themselves. Lastly, just on this graph before I move forward, or this page before I move forward, it's just worth pointing out this graph at the side here, which shows uh, the, the lighter green column showing a position of our members who are more than one or more months in arrears and the dark green showing the overall industry average. And what you can't quite see the numbers from where you're sitting is the industry average is double from where we're at. Now, I think it's just worth pointing out and sort of reflecting, having gone through these challenges in the macroeconomic and the 2022 crisis and beyond, for our mortgage book and our lending book to still be in such a pleasing position and a healthy position is very good for the society and shows the approach that we've been taking to lending. So overall, as Colin mentioned, a healthy set of financials, but we must, but must build on that further. And to be clear, our focus is upon growth, our focus is upon controlling costs further, and our focus is upon both building the mortgage book plus achieving the desirable net interest margin. The next part of the balance scorecard that I want to talk to you about is excellence. Uh, in this metric, put simply, we focus on how we get things better. Uh, at the start of 2023, we communicated across the business a number of areas that we were looking to try and improve upon. And the topics that you'll see on screen there are no small undertaking indeed. There was a number of other topics that we under, uh, undertook as well. But I am very pleased to say that we've delivered, and in some topics still are delivering in the, those areas. As Colin also mentioned, for those that use our web page and our social pages, you will have seen that we've had a complete overhaul. And the idea of this is to make us more friendly, to be a little bit more helpful, or quite a bit more helpful to our members, but also importantly, to pave the way for the next de uh, deployment of our digital program. And the website was de uh, deployed early 2023, and we have seen a steady level of usage from our members. As Colin also mentioned, consumer duty, not just not a project, but an industry-wide focus, which really challenged the way that the industry thinks about members and customers, in particular, the outcomes. What we've been doing is focusing and thinking about taking that regulatory requirement and making sure that we are match fit as an organization. And it's really challenged our thinking and also positively highlighted the areas where we needed to change either our setup our focus, or even challenging the areas where we think they were doing well, actually just how well is that uh, perceived by our members. <laughs> As I remember, it's not a con consumer duty is not a one-off project and it's not a deadline. It's a fundamental shift in how we think and operate. And it's for this reason, as coming into the CEO, I've talked very clearly and continue to do so about being very member-centric. It should just be the way that we do business. And our desire is to put the member at the center of everything that we do and understand what good looks like for their experience. So continue to keep you updated on that and indeed we'll engage further with our member panel to try and bring this a little bit more to life. 
So website consumer duty and other things are perhaps quite visible, quite obvious in terms of how you interact with the society. We've also focused on some things internally and just in the people on the payroll side them, just as an example, our new, we introduced a new payroll system, which previously was quite an antiquated, antiquated and manual way of doing the basics. So we've actively sought to have an automated way of doing it, which just improves efficiency and accuracy. But we also use that uh, opportunity to bring in a new people system, which is called uh, amusingly HiBob. Now, as we operate as a hybrid and increasingly a hybrid working business, it's really important that we have a people system, people tools that allow us to communicate effectively. And if we want our leaders to really invest and really lead our people, which are our, our business, then we know it's important that they have a tool. And HiBob is almost like a Facebook of the workplace, which allows people leaders to have all the information to hand, but also to celebrate and inform people across a number of different areas. And it's a, a system which I think will continue to grow its popularity as people use it further. Now, moving on, then those that know me from the member panel, there's quite a few familiar faces. You will know that I've talked about digital. And as Colin mentioned, there's the four distinct phases of moving to the cloud, the self saving self-serve, an app and a mortgage portal. I'm also delighted to say that we have delivered phase one uh, in a very, very effective way. And today we gave our first go, no go decision, a go decision, I should say, on the next phase of digital, the first part of that, which we'll see us not only do phase one, but phase two on target and on budget. So a very pleasing position to be for us because this is a fundamental shift in big complex changes, not just to our organization, but to the sector and organizations at our side our size. Lastly, on digital, if I can just spend just a quick minute and just to give my best wishes to Richard Parkin, uh, who is our project lead on digital. Sadly, Richard is going through some difficult health issues at this point and has had to step away from the project. But I just wanted to give him thanks, and I know he will look back at this on AGM, uh, but also just to thank him for the strong position that we're, we're in at this point in time. And we do wish him both in terms of me personally, but also the society, wish him best and for a speedy recovery. Next one, okay. Just one final one on excellence, if you allow me to indulge slightly, but uh, this, this is a, a slide which I feel very, very proud about, and I know that a number of people in the organization do. Uh, in late 2022 and into 2023, we really wanted to focus on being more of a niche lender. And put short, that is providing finance, mortgages, uh, in areas that perhaps the big banks and other lenders would either struggle or didn't want to operate. And one such area of that is self-build mortgages. I was at a dinner, an awards dinner, uh, a couple of years back and sat through what was a, a very entertaining prize giving. I got a bit bored when it got to the final award was for uh, the best guttering. But uh, <laughs> at this point, we, uh, there was uh, uh, the prize for the best le uh, lender for self-built mortgages. And I was looking at the peer, uh, my peers in the group that was in there and thinking, Hinkley Rugby should be in this and should win this. So we actively took it as a target that we wanted for 2023 to be known in the industry as the best lender for self-built mortgages. And there it is, we won that award and we are therefore recognised as the UK's best self-built mortgage provider. I hope you feel very proud about that as a society doing that. I know certainly within the business, we feel very proud about it. And it does show the journey that we're going on and be more of a, more of a, a niche lender for that. So something to build on if you pardon the pun. <laughs> So people is the next area of the balance scorecard that I want to focus on. And just, I mentioned previously, people are our business. People are very important to us. And therefore, it should stand to, to, to reason that our people agenda and our people's strategy, strategy to bring out the best in our people. Now, through the recruitment of Nikki Barker, which is Nikki, our chief people officer, we've moved away from being a more traditional reactive HR uh, structure to be more engaging and more forward looking as a learning and people development business. The green wheel on the left outlines the nine areas of concentration in the team and it ranges from everything from talent, leadership, all the way through to our ESG agenda. Now it links to the wheel on the right, and again, I'm not asking you to look at the detail because it's very small on this one, but it's a wheel that relates to best companies, a firm that we've partnered with who really in short give us a survey to tell us how we're doing and how we're performing in the eyes of our colleagues. In our first year in 2022, we targeted this 
and launched it to the business and we were awarded with the status of one to watch, which was a great starting point. Now these surveys are very useful snapshot. The, the end result is almost a byproduct, but what is more useful is the feedback that we get, the specific data that tells us where we're doing things right or the areas that we need to improve upon. And again, we repeated the exercise in 2023 and we were awarded a one star, very good. So further progress and a, and a great position to be in. But also quite importantly, we had over 90% of our staff uh, can not only have Evan Crosskey's le legacy continue across the building society, but for those that know that that knew Evan was a very well liked and known person within the society and he sadly passed away in the most tragic of circumstances but we were delighted that his memory would be continued not only within Hinkley and Rugby but across the Belton Society sector as a whole and the Belton Society Associ Association named an Academia Award relating to the, their Masters programme in Evan's memory uh, and for those that know Evan I don't think there could be a more fitting uh, remembrance for him so a nice moment for us to reflect upon but but also linking to that, the Loughborough Masters Programme, something which has really benefited to ourselves and something which we're really committed to continue doing for growing home talent. And we're starting to see the return on that and the benefits for some of the people that have passed through it and very successfully. So an area that we will continue to focus upon. I move on to member and community, and uh, don't worry, you're not going to have to listen much more to me. There'll be other people that we'll be speaking, but member and community really is a focus area which I think should set us apart. I think it's one of the things that makes a mutual different, and it's something that makes a regional mu mutual or a regionally focused mutual uh, really, uh, really focused. It's something we should shout loud and proud about. It's almost about what does being a member of Hinkley and Rugby mean, and how does it benefit the communities that we serve and support. Now the next few slides will help outline this, but I just wanted to also start by saying this is an area that we're really focused on, but I also think it's an area, another area that we can be a little bit more focused and bring a little bit more clarity to, and just being clear about what is our purpose, our ambition, our values, and how do we bring this out in the day-to-day -day life and how we interact in the community. But under the banner of learn, grow and excel together, you can see there's a number of different things that we're involved in, whether it be financial education, sharing of profits or workplace savings, they're all initiatives that we make a priority. Thank you. Now just bringing out these, uh, the community grant that uh, the society established uh, under the, sort of the three buckets of mental health and wellbeing, poverty and environmental. You'll see some of the initiatives that we have supported and uh, you'll see some of the pictures from our members and our colleagues and they're getting involved in it. I want to talk to you a little bit more about what that looks like for 2024 and we're going to hear from Kieran uh, and Leicestershire Cares at some point later this evening but I think if you just look at the number of things that we're also involved in this I think it's quite telling and you know Many of these initiatives that we have and many of the things that we've involved here is worth pointing out that these are achievements that have been completed by colleagues in their own time, under their own agenda, and just because they want to be involved in help and support. And that really is quite testament to the quality of the people and the focus that they are for, doing both to support local communities and Hinkley and Rugby. So into 2024, and we continue the great work on the community grant uh, recipients and uh, lots of areas of focus that we want to do, but rather than hear more from myself, if we can go to the next one, please. Feed the Hungry is one of the initiatives that would be the recipients, and uh, if I can just ask, uh, perhaps, if you want to come up and chat a little bit further about that, it would be quite helpful to do so. All right? Yes. Come on up. much for having us we really appreciate um, your support um, so what you can see here is our new project that is about to happen um, so and that's part of what you've invested into um, so to just introduce us um, myself and my colleague Gavin we're both from Feed the Hungry um, we are an international humanitarian aid charity um, but we work in in the UK and locally and um, so actually Hinkley and Rugby is one of the areas that we we are working actively in and um, so just kind of to give you an overview of what this van here does and um, so we run a community supermarket initiative so it runs out of um, various sites over South Leicestershire, South Warwickshire and also expanding into rugby um, in the near future. So 
what um, your money and your grant has done so far is we are about to renovate a vehicle that looks exactly like this um, to go out into the rugby area. So what does this van do? Um, this is a um, adapted St John's ambulance vehicle. Um, it will be looking at tackling poverty sort of from a medium to long term perspective. So as our community pantries, what they do is that they um, take people from um, in a medium to long term circumstances, people who are facing um, ongoing situations and actually we feed people um, for a cost of £5 to our members. Um, but actually it's not just about food, it's about bringing people in um, and doing community with them. So. What you can see, there is a van, and um, people can get on board with us um, and they register and they pay their five pounds and for their five pounds they get about 35 pounds worth of food. Um, but actually it's more than that. We have um, vehicles that park up in various centres around um, Burbage, Earl Shilton, Rugby uh, and Wembrook. Um, and actually it's about engaging within the community. So people are getting on board and they are going through sort of welfare checks, so um, financial inclusion, looking at um, sort of mental health support, anything that we can put in place to support people beyond food. So actually food's the draw, food gets people on board, but um, providing the support and the advice services is a massive part of what we do as well. Um, so your donation is going into um, renovating the next vehicle, that will be going into the rugby area. Um, so we're really, really excited um, to be partnering with the Building Society and also from the Community Foundation as well. Um, so actually that will be going into renovating, um, it will be going into adapting it to make sure that it can be used for, um, for people to get on board. Um, we are really passionate about going into rural areas, so we want to make sure that actually the pantry is going to the areas that really need it. Um, so we are rapidly expanding our locations and actually looking at bringing the services to people rather than people having to reach them. So that's why, kind of why our area is in mobile, so like a mobile library, um, it's exactly that. Um, it's coming to people and meeting people where they're at. So we just really want to thank you for your um, support and um, yeah, we know that through Nikki and for various colleagues that it would be a really exciting partnership for the next sort of year and I know that they're willing to get their hands dirty um, in the renovation projects as well. So yeah, we just thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little short clip here if the technology allows us that will just bring us a little bit more to life. The Mobile Community Pantry is a project from Feed the Hungry and Warwickshire County Council that will help alleviate food poverty in areas around Warwickshire that are suffering from deprivation. How the pantry differs from other models of food provision is rather than being handed a package of three days of food, the member will come along and they get to choose the products they need rather than having products that they may or may not need or go to waste. We get to know the members over time, they get to know us, so we can then start to tackle some of the causes of why they're in the situations they've found themselves. What's the future for the mobile pantry? I'd love to say there is no future, but sadly with the current economic climate going the way it is, more and more families are struggling and are going to need our help. So we're hoping to expand from our current two days a week to running five days a week in various locations across Warwickshire and South Leicestershire. If you want to find out more information about the Mobile Community Pantry, visit www.thecommunitypantry.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, when we're producing and pulling together things for, for the AGM, uh, sometimes you get a little bit of information or you get a clip that kind of stops you in your tracks a little bit. And when we're producing this and looking at the, the, the slides, the comment about the future, we would love to not have a future is quite telling. 
And so for us, being able to provide a grant and being able to help and partner with us, it's the reason why we're here. It makes a difference. We're delighted to make a difference. But thank you so much for being part of it and wish you every success for the next part of this. So thank you. Just one last part, if you don't mind, if that's OK. I just promised a little peek into 2024 and bringing back the balanced scorecard and the continuity between the past few years and what I want to be doing going forward. We continue on the four pillars, the memory community, financial, excellence and people but if I can just again bring this a little bit more out so for people uh, sorry for member and, and, and uh, community we want to, to be continue and, and enhance being highly member centric we want to ensure that our products the services are first class and really designed for our members and I intend to build this as just a way that we do things and be known as an outstanding member focused society we have a, a way to go on this but we're very clear about where we want to go and equally and more importantly is all my team are bought into this and want to achieve this as well. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that. And the financial side, the growth of the mortgage and the savings book is paramount. We wanted to continue to build our member face base. We want to be clear about the areas that we are operating, the type of lending that we're doing, the types of things that we're doing savings, bringing workplace savings out, bringing the branches and digital to your home and your workplace. In the efficient and excellence, we want to be efficient and effective, and it's more than a strap line. It's about removing the ineffective and the inefficient costs that we have in it, but it's about starting to really think about how we start working and offering digital solutions up to maybe members that we don't have today, or maybe some solutions that our existing members want, or maybe don't, but it's providing an efficient and an effective way of other means of being able to transact with us. And lastly, as I've said, people are our business. I really pride myself in creating an environment which is enjoyable and effective uh, to work from and really getting the, the best out of our people and uh, being a, a, an outstanding place to work for. So learning and development will continue to be a key focus in an area for me. So in short, a really good 2023, a lot more to come from us and I really look forward to being your CEO who will deliver that for the society. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, it's a lot easier that uh, his name is Barry and not Colin, by the way. <laughs> we were constantly getting confused. I'm Colin, and Colin Fife was, yeah, anyway. Um, <clears throat> can we then move on now to um, the part of the meeting that I know that you've all been waiting for, uh, which is um, the, the voting on the, on the resolutions. Um, so you'll have an opportunity now to vote, if you've not already done so, on the resolutions before the meeting. There will be opportunity to ask questions at the end of the meeting, but if anyone has any questions now before we go into the voting, please can we, can we have them. We'll be looking at the annual report and accounts, the appointment of auditors, the director's remuneration report, uh, and then the election and re-election of directors. So can I ask, are there any questions on those resolutions before we move into the, the voting? Okay, there are no, no questions at this point. So can I ask you then that we now we move into the conducting the vote and I'll ask Grace Tavanera, our company secretary, to move amongst you. <laughs> She's going to read out the resolutions. Yes, so the resolutions, um, you may vote uh, for the resolution, against or you may withheld your vote. The board recommends you vote in favour for all resolutions. Those of you who have a voting form in front of you will be those who haven't voted online. So I'll give you a moment to, uh, to fill out the vote as we go through the resolutions. So item number one is to receive the director's report, annual accounts and business statement and auditor's report for the year ended 30th of November 2023. Item number two is to reappoint Mazars LLP to hold office as auditor of the society until the conclusion of the next annual general meeting. Item number three, to approve the director's remuneration report for the year ended 30th of November 2023. And item number four is to vote on the election and re-election of directors. So I'll give you all a moment to complete those and then I'll come and collect them and Lee from uh, House and South Bruton will also assist. Um, and we will uh, then carry on with the vote.
Do we have voting forms? Or does anybody need a voting form? Have you all? We've handed uh, out about 10. Yeah. So if you, we can collect those in. Yes, they're ready to be collected. I'd like to hand them up and I'll come and collect them. Right, I can't remember it's on my books, which is yeah. somewhere with, I think, that guy. That's why we have them in front, thank you. Thank you. Anyone down Thank you. Thank you for your, your votes. Um, and now the difficult job of counting them. <laughs> or at least adding to the ones that we've already received and, and verifying them. Um, whilst we wait for Housens to calculate the final percentages, can I ask uh, Kieran Breen to join us? Kieran is Chief Executive of Leicestershire Cares. Um, and I'd quite like him to say a few words about some of the valuable work that they do and some of the things that make us so proud to be associated with them. So, Kieran. Okay. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Kieran, and I'm the CEO of Leicestershire Cares, and I'm delighted to be here today. And I've actually, I think, about, I think I've been a CEO for seven years, and in the next seven years, I've always been impressed with the staff of HRBS and I was looking for our sort of records and if you bother to go on our website and you want to scroll back through kind of our history you will see that year in year out HRBS have been playing quite a key role in the work of Leicestershire Cares and they've won quite a lot of awards and recognition for that. Um, if I tell you just a very little bit about Leicestershire Cares, perhaps our, our little tagline would say something like we connect business, community and the public sector so everybody can thrive or nobody is left behind. Okay, so we put a lot of emphasis on, it says that, is it on together we can, right, on creative partnership. Um, sadly, as you know, we're living at a time where there's a lot of hardship. I'll throw a little thing out. How many, what percentage of children in Leicester live in poverty? Anybody want to shout out a... Uh, should I put you on the spot? Does anybody want to feel great? You would hope it's second digits. I reckon, right. The report came out last week. It's currently 33% of children in Leicester living in poverty, where poverty is def defined as your family earn less than 80% of the nat of the normal minimum wage. Okay. Um, in certain parts of Leicester, in Leicester East, that figure's 47%. And I give you just another little fact. Have you got on a bicycle? I live in Knighton now. But if you cycled from Knighton in, say, to Highfields, the life expectancy drops by about seven years. Okay, that's in the sixth richest country in the world. So there are big challenges and big issues around. What does Leicestershire Cares do? I think what's kind of, we put a lot of emphasis on connection. One of the things that when you were speaking today about this, you know, HRBS being a people organization about caring about your members. At one level, and don't get me wrong, you want to give us money, you know, we really do need money, really do need money, okay? But what HRBS does, which is really great, it gets its staff to connect with people. Because I think the thing is that when you talk about people who are suffering, when you talk about poor people, you know, they, they become a sort of label, don't they? Even when I said that, I just said to you, 36% of children are in poverty. Mm -hmm. It's a stat, isn't it? 47% of children are in poverty. This, this will throw a million. But what that really means tonight is there are children who are hungry. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't know how they're going to pay the bills. Right? And there are kids living at home, they haven't got a digital connection through COVID, all of that stuff. All of a sudden, how am I going to get online? How am I, how am I, I don't know, my mum and dad only came to this country four years ago. I don't know how to get on university. I don't know how to make a connection. And what we do with organisations like HRBS, and HRBS have been brilliant at that, we get staff to volunteer and connect with people and to pass on skills and confidence. Okay? And I guess in doing that, one of our little taglines was we just turn despair into hope. Because quite often, a lot of the young people we work with, one thing they've got in common, a lot of them are isolated. We do a lot of work with care experienced young people. Okay? So that's young children through no fault of their own ended up in the care system. But then come age 18, the care system says, you've got to go now, but there are no houses. There's no homes, are you going to go? Now, once again, I've got a 16-year-old daughter, she's beginning to think about going to university and you know, putting a bit of money aside. And I'm, I mean, I'm assuming people who've got children have gone to university. Think of all the support you give to your child going to university and the help that they get. You get a very vulnerable child who's been in care and come out in, bye-bye, 
and the next thing you're living in like a DOS house in Leicester with two young offenders below you, somebody who deals drug above you, and all this kind of stuff. And these kids feel very isolated and very vulnerable. They're very, you know, you can imagine they're prey to people leading them astray. So what staff at HRBS, <coughs> if I cut around, I'll get a crack on, is that we, br we get people from businesses often to come out and offer that hope, helping hand, and they've been brilliant. So we have staff coming in, working with people, talking about careers, connecting, showing them about this is how you could get on in this career, this is how you might fill in a CV, this is how you might do that. But in doing so, what they're really doing, beyond all those kind of technical skills they're handing on, they're showing that people care, that somebody is out there. And if you've ever been down and out in your life, if you've ever reached a situation where you think, Shut, I'm on my own here, this is really bad, never ever underestimate the impact that kindness can have on somebody. That somebody who you've never known, who's never met, has just reached out. I could go on and on about, I mean, Hinkley Rugby Building Site have collected bags of hope that have gone to homeless people that we've distributed. Uh, treats for families who aren't, aren't going to have a Christmas, they've got involved in that, they've gone and support community groups we partner with. But most of all, what they've really done is they've connected, they haven't treated people like an other or a statistic, they've gone out, they've got to know about people, they've cared and they've made a difference. And I hope, you know, and what a wonderful organisation, they absolutely walk the talk of corporate social responsibility and you should be dead proud of everything you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kieran. In, in, indeed, we are very proud, and uh, well, so we should be proud to be associated with a, an organisation that are doing such things, turning despair into hope. What a, what a fantastic job you're doing! So, well done, and thank you. Um, I now have the results of the voting. Uh, <coughs> I know, contain your excitement. Uh, I will just read out the percentage votes in favour of each resolution for completeness, but, but there is more detail behind it if you want it. How long have we got? No, I don't know. <laughs> so the votes in favour of uh, the receiving the report and accounts with 98.48%. Uh, to appoint Mazars LLP as auditors was 96.42% and to approve the director's remuneration report was 91.21%. Um, I'm happy to say that all of those resolutions were carried, as are all of the resolutions for the election of directors. Um, and if you would like me to read the percentages out, I will. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> this, this is uh, largely now because the directors have got a little side bet on who gets it. <laughs> uh, Tony Alexander, 95.28. Uh, Manuela Pifani, 93.87. Linda Blackwell, 94.99. Barry Carter, 95.15. Rebecca Griffin, 95.27. John Lowe, 94.83. John Mulvey, 95.30. Barbara Taid, 94.72. And finally, Nemini Wynne Evans, 94.48. So, congratulations to all of you. You are elected as directors of the Society. Well done. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for your votes and thank you for having your say. Um, we're nearing the, the close of the meeting now, but just before I do so, um, are there any questions that any of you might have? Yes, sir. Um, going back five or six years now, before COVID started, um, Hinkley and Rugby were open till five at night. Um, now I was talking, I am now retired myself, but I was talking about recently to some of my work colleagues who work shifts. And the current system, uh, closing at two, if you're working six or two, you can't use the building society. Um, I, I do appreciate in this day and age a lot of people um, uh, doing it by computer, that sort of thing. But surely, um, the move from two till five is a, is a massive jump. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have been, I do actually have an account in the uh, Shilton and San Sandra as well as in I've been in both of them in the last week queuing in the afternoon to get served. So 
I don't take it fully that there's nobody wants to be in the services in the afternoon. Yeah, it's okay. a chicken and egg situation. If you finish work at two and you go on the shift, you can't do that. Yeah. So I wonder if any long term. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I appreciate your, your question, and, and, and certainly it, it is a subject that, that received much discussion um, mm. um, at the Hinkley and Rugby. Can, can I ask Barry to perhaps to give a, a more <coughs> fuller response? Yeah, so the, the, since COVID, we've obviously seen a big decline in footfall in the high streets in many of the areas that we, we, we serve. And Although we close at two, we're still offering meetings or often appointments with members from two to five. So anything that you might want to talk about, anything you might need, we're absolutely open to having meetings and discussing with that with you. We haven't seen the footfall back to pre-pandemic levels, but we want to be still committed to the communities that we serve. And so some of the things that we're looking about is how do we perhaps take things like pop-up branches, so part of digital middle of the year, we'll have the capabilities to take branches out. And some of the areas that we're doing is rather than try and make you like you've alluded to doing shifts, is can we take Hinkley and Rugby to your workplace? So do these types of pop-up branches. <coughs> can we operate different hours in the evening perhaps? And as we get digital capabilities, there'll be things that you can do yourself, should you want to. So our savings portal that will be coming online at the end of April will mean that you can self-serve and do transactions and balance inquiries and the likes. An app will be deployed in May, which means that you'll be able to have the society in your pocket and then we'll have some further developments that'll come on. But we continue to watch this, the high street and the future of the high street, not just for building societies, but the high street generally is pretty unwritten at this point in time. We're still committed to the areas that we serve, but we're just having to have understand how do our members want to transact and how do they want us. I see it being a bit of a combination of both, where we have the digital solutions, we have a physical presence, and actually we come out to places that are convenient to you. But we're going to do more of that throughout this year. We've just not had the technology until middle of this year to be able to do some of the other things that we've been offering. So I hope that helps address some of the points. But we're not fixed to only being to to open up to two o'clock. The demand comes back, we can change it. But right now, what we're seeing is the demand between nine to two. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I add to that? Would it not be possible perhaps on one day or two days a week to have your pre-booked appointments in the morning and not open up until 11 o'clock and on that day stay open until 5 o'clock? Yeah. So just a bit certain people can we go in sure. after 2 o'clock one day a week? Yeah, yeah this is, I, I think we're, we're very flexible and open to it. It's one of the things that we want to do via our member panels is just understand and engage a little bit more, just understand what is the demand. The 9 to 2 has been based upon really pretty historic information coming out of COVID of when we've seen the footfall, but absolutely that, that wouldn't cause us any issue at all. We're actually transacting, we're still, you know, dare I say, people are working and being paid from 9 to 5, so whatever that works and fits for our members, we're very open and agnostic to what that looks like. But some people do not want to make an appointment, they just want to turn up, you know. Yeah, yeah, we've got, so yes, in short, is the answer to it, but we're trying to cater for the different needs of what we want on this. I do see that it's a hybrid of being able to still have the branch physically present, to having digital solutions for those that want to transact, but I actually see being able to go out. But many of the communities that we serve, we're the last financial institution in those areas, but we know there is also a demand going out to, you know, Brighton libraries, coffee shops, all those things. And we want to look into that because we also see that as an area that's probably going to be developed over the next few years. But yes, in, in short to your point, we would happily do that. Thank you, good questions, thank you. Any other questions? No, well, I think I can, we've reached the point now. What have I forgotten? Right, she's looking at me. Three set questions. Oh, you did. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm looking at you. That's forgot. She's looking at me. They forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so we have we have a question that's already been submitted. Yeah. Okay. So the, one of the, one of the questions that was submitted uh, was what action is or will be taken to enable transfers of funds from the society's accounts to external accounts without cost. This is particularly relevant now that the number of bank branches in town has reduced. So. This is, uh, at the moment, if you were to wanted to send money, it would either be as a combination of a cheque or as a CHAPS payment. The cheque both takes time to clear, perhaps a little bit antiquated as a process, and CHAPS costs a fee. 
So as part of the digital program that we're bringing in, so digital is not just physically an app, but it's how we actually transact. We're bringing in faster payments or introducing faster payments capabilities. Now that'll offer a couple of things. It'll mean that in branch you'll be able to do faster payments. Makes sense, without cost. But secondly, and probably more importantly is, like you were alluding to earlier, sir, of having uh, ability to send monies out of hours at a convenience. You'll be able to do that on the savings portal and via our app. So what you would actually do is have a nominated bank account. So let's say, for example, my bank account is Halifax. I would have a savings account as I do with Hinkley and Rugby. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a shiver from the old days. Uh, and I would send money from my Hinkley and Rugby savings account into my bank account in Halifax for me to do whatever I need to do. And you can equally send monies backwards and forwards. And that would be without cost and at a, at a location time that's suitable for yourself. So well, it's one that we've arguably should have been doing for quite some time, but it will definitely make things that much easier to transact. Uh, another question that we had just on uh, the about attending head office with a passbook to be updated, uh, and previously Colin has uh, Colin Fife would have held the, the book and arranged for it to be updated. And why can't we do that within head office? So, look, head office is not a functioning branch, hence why it doesn't have the capabilities of the counters or being able to update passbooks. We we don't intend to change that as a, a functioning head office for obvious reasons, but we do obviously understand that whenever we're attending on these rare occasions and the likes, it probably feels a little bit of an inconvenience. <coughs> we would ask in the first instance that you attend a local branch to have your, your, your book updated. It's both a reason to support a branch, it's an opportunity to engage with our members and our staff. But if that's not convenient, I don't want to keep saying digital is the answer, but we will have digital capabilities, which will mean that you'll be able to view your balances online, the interest that's pending, the interest that's due, and you'll also be able to transact on that as well. So appreciate the point about the passbooks, appreciate the point about head office, but ultimately our branch network is the areas that you'll be able to support doing passbooks and the links. Mm -hmm. Good. I knew you'd come back. Yes, <laughs> Please. Having asked the question, the point at issue was that you need the passport for identification. Yeah. And in my case, that means two separate journeys. One yeah. to get the passport update, updated at a branch, and another one to bring it in yeah. here as identification. Sure. So the point You've got all this computing yeah. uh, assets here. It seems to me that it's a little strange. You can't do anything here. The computer should be able to talk to one another. Yeah, it's a very fair challenge. So I think the point about the passbook, if I can part that one, but one about the identification, that I think it's a very fair challenge. At the moment, what we ask for you to attend is to either bring your passbook or a passport or some other form of identification. As we look to sort of improve things, I mentioned about efficiency and effectiveness, we absolutely will We're find asking, an ID. Chuck there asked, yeah, they've got over 100 quid in the account. Yeah. The, and the passport is approved. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm not standing in front of you to say, yes, that's the most, there's not an antiquated way to do it. We'll find a solution so that we can identify it and it's not going to be an inconvenience for yourself on it. But I don't have the solution for it today. So my apologies, I can't give you a better answer than that. Thanks. It explains why the question was asked. Yeah, no, thank you for it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any further questions? This isn't a question, it's just a comment on one of the earlier people wrote. Um, Earl Shorten Building Society is the only financial institution apart from the post office in Earl Shorten. Mm -hmm. There isn't a bank there and there hasn't been a bank there for a number of years. Mm -hmm. and there is a nationwide as well, but people like the Earl Shorten, it's local, it's friendly, etc. And they conduct a lot of business in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an important point, and I mentioned earlier that we're talking about by being one of the last financial institutions in these areas, there becomes an increasing responsibility for us to be there, not just to provide services, but whether it be morally to educate the next generation of savers or borrowers, we have something there societal that perhaps other organisations don't have. And that's one of the reasons why you've seen about the, sort of the community whereby, whether we're still physically located in branches or whether we're going out to schools or whether we're going out to workplaces, being there as a provider, that we have a human face, we can talk talk about savings, mortgages and the likes. It's one of the reasons why we exist. There's been a regional focus on it. So the, the point is not lost on us, but we do. We'll keep being, remain committed to the communities that we serve, for sure. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attendance and your support. Uh, there being no further business, the meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you.